so yeah, generative music, playful visualizations, and where to find them. And because time is very limited, I'm going to jump right in to an introduction of who I am. Uh, hi, I'm Lisa. Uh, uh, I work in a um, non-profit called Open Knowledge Foundation Germany, which, where, like, which is dedicated to open data, open knowledge, and transparency, um, and like civic tech and like strengthening the civic society. Um, I'm also like I live in Berlin, and I'm involved with the local um, crypto party chapter, where we um, teach people tools to um, protect their privacy and anonymity online. Um, I'm also uh, really into video games. Uh, my hobby is. is not just playing, but also making a lot of video games because I just like the, the interaction and the interactive um, possibilities that, that games um, provide to people. Um, and also because buzzwords, creative coding, generative art and algorithms, and also like hardware projects is some, uh, like are all things that I'm really into because it's, it's very easy to combine all these ideas with um, playfulness. Um, exactly. So at one point I realized that I'm sort of in this um, intersection between like two circles um, or, like and where the circles represent people um, and their usage of technology. So on the one side we have um, this like very skeptic approach is like people are like not sure if, if technology is like really necessary, is it harmful, um, will I lose control over um, my life, my data, my home even with like certain home, inf um, home technology. There's a lot of people running around. Hi. Um, <laughs> So, um, so this is one side, um, which like with people that I in interact with a lot, and then there's the other side with like the creative media people who are like, oh my god, new technology, can we try this out? What are the limits? It's just like, I don't know, spend weekends and weekends on it um, just to like see how far we can go and like what what else is there, and I thought this was really interesting, so I wanted to like create a piece or something that like explores the space or like sort of like where can I like take people from like the, the skeptic side and says like, hey, like there's a lot of like weird and obscure and scary technology out there, um, but there's also this like cool and creative, um, very, very friendly and beautiful side of technology. Um, and I thought music is just, um, well, the, the perfect way to get started because a lot of people instantly feel connected to music even if they don't feel connected to technology. And since I'm a web developer um, and the browser offers basically everything we need, um, I want to do it in the browser. And this is where, over the last couple of months and then weeks, um, I developed a thing called Party for Two. Um, and what is Party for Two? Um, like, just roughly an idea. It's an, it's an, or it aims to be an enjoyable introduction for people to a more creative side um, of technology. Uh, just like, a, it shouldn't be scary. It shouldn't be um, in any way like um, intimidate people. Um, and I thought this like. Party is such a great concept in general because, or like from my own experiences, I've met a lot of interesting people at parties and people that I would have never met anywhere else um, if it weren't for like this weird social gathering or get together that um, somebody organizes. And I thought this was really cool and I wanted to like bring the party concept into this. And yes, the name is a reference to Shania Twain's song Party for Two. Um, okay, so without further ado, let's throw a little party, um, and I'm gonna like use the the microphone necklace, and I hope this works. Sorry, sorry. Um, okay, so oh, okay. Now I n now I need to speak louder because the microphone is falling away from me. This is interesting. Um, so I will be playing this um, using a gamepad, uh, which is connected by USB to my browser. And this is already like the Party for Two interface. Um, you will see, so there's two different modes, music mode and visuals mode. You can see that in the upper right corner. And then um, you can see which buttons I press in the lower right corner. So let's get started. I hope it's not too loud. Okay, so yeah, I just, like set the volume down a bit. So this is, um, what is happening right now is that um, a piece of music was generated and uh, you can see some sort of visualization here. Um, I thought it's kind of like this view into the computer, just like I'm, I'm looking through a hole and then it sees like, oh, what's, what's happening in the computer? Um, I'm gonna switch to visuals mode. Um, I'm gonna like, can play with the pixels in the background, can obviously play with the colors, um, like switch to like different times of just like representation, um, which is if if you might have guessed you might have guessed it that it's the the 
um, FFT data from the audio that is uh, generated. Um, let's, let's see, maybe here. And the, the more interesting thing is obviously music mode, where I'm, I'm gonna like make the music louder again, and then so that you maybe hear there's some effects. I don't have a lot of time to play around with it. Um, and I also don't have a way of closing it. <laughs> okay, thank you. If you want to play this later, you can um, just ask me. That this is portable, obviously. Okay, I'm going to detach the microphone. Okay. Um, quickly, like, how did I build this? Um, so, as every good party, um, also this piece has basically three main ingredients. Um, the music, visuals, or something that people can look at, and interaction. Um, music is obviously done by the Web Audio API, um, which is fantastic, and even um, I, as like, not a professional musician, or like, I've never professionally worked with the Web Audio API, um, it's still like, I think the most low-level piece of of technology that allows me to make music or to yeah write music. Um, and here in particular, I'm using JukeGen, which is a whoop, next slide procedural music generator um, that I wrote just for this. Um, and that was a lot of fun because I've never done such a thing before. And since I don't know how to write music properly, um, I thought it was like it would be cool if somebody would write the music for me. Um, and the entire approach of like how I went about this, um, like I basically followed a very um, non cody tutorial, but it's more of like a mindset tutorial by Krista Kaitila, who is known for one game a month, where you create one game a month for a year to like be better at making games. Um, and this is a lot of like um, don't don't even pay attention to like musical theory. It's just like it's only supposed to sound like music. Um, in a very like video gamey hands-on way, um, so that you like, um, yeah, imagine it being at a game jam. It's like, hey, I need like some music, some sound right now. Um, and I thought it was like a super lovely tutorial that I thought it was like, hey, even I can do that. Um, underneath, I used Tone.js, which is an amazing library for all the synths and scheduling because working with bare bones web audio API is still kind of like overwhelming if you have no idea what you're doing. Um, and Tone helps a lot with this. Um, and this is also available um, like under an open source license, obviously, and on NPM. So if you just want to have something that creates sounds as you wanted to hear them, or like, as you just heard them right now, um, you can use it and like NPM install it and it's there. Um, cool. Uh, a little bit about how the, the generator itself works. Um, so once you initialize um, an object, um, I, I pick a base note and a scale, um, a simple beat pattern and some effects, even though you don't hear them at the beginning. And then once you start playing, I generate music, uh, the melody snippets on the fly. And the way I do this is very, yeah. Um, I basically have like, look at all the, like, the, the time slots that I have for, for a measure, and then like randomly fill these with notes that are like, orientate themselves from like the previous note and then on the scale, and then like a set interval of semitones that it can even like go um, up or down from. So very basic. Um, then I like loop this uh, snippet, and then I like generate a new one. Um, this is sort of not ideal because, as you may have realized, um, for music there's sort of like needs to be some sort of repetition so that people can see it's like, oh, this is a melody. This might be a chorus or something. This is not happening right now um, because as I started to play around with the like, oh, I need to like remember some of the snippets to so then later loop them. Um, I ran into some performance issues, so it was easier to just like create something and throw it away. Um, which, which worked much better in the beginning. Um, yeah, And then you can interact with this, um, as I did with the, with the gamepad. Um, there's this, this interval range um, that I said, so that it, from one tone to the next, it can only jump a certain um, maximum amount of, of semitones, but you can like, also change this. I'm not sure if this came across well enough, so if it's now jumping like two semitones or maybe eight, 
Um, but in the long run, you can see like if you want to like go from like a very fast um, beat to like a slower beat, and then you also say it's like okay, but now I want to have like bigger jumps um, in the scale or something. Um, also the effect wetness, so I'm not actually um, interacting with the effect values itself, so I'm just with like the um, yeah, how much of the effect you actually hear in, in, in the output. And then obviously just like volume and BPM. Um, I had some other things in mind, but um, I th yeah, there's already a lot of buttons on the controller, but I then ran out of space of buttons on my controller. I was like, okay, um, either I need to like find another navigational concept for the controller or just like stop with the interface right now. Um, as for the music, for the visuals, um, I thought like, hey, you know what, I'm gonna just use raw um, WebGL and GLSL, so like the shader coding language. Um, because I had some previous knowledge of it, I thought that it's gonna be fine. Um, so WebGL, if you're not familiar, is um, accelerated 2D and 3D rendering on your graphics card. Um, as you would do it with like, um, just like, as you would usually visualize probably, you would like, um, set up a canvas element and use a 2D context, I use a, web, a GL context. Um, and then in this context, you create a program in JavaScript and then link a vertex shader and a fragment shader, where the vertex shader is usually coordinates of like shapes, and the fragment shader is then responsible for the colors um, on the shapes. Um, and you usually would use like 3JS or some sort of library so that you can, that is easy to inter, um, interface with. I thought like I can do this better, so I chose the DOI setup. Um, where basically my vertex shader has no shapes, it's just two triangles forming a rectangle canvas. Um, and then I hand-coded the fragment shader and did all the magic um, inside this, which was a bad idea. Um, even though I had a lot of control over the, 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 the environment and what kind of data and can feed directly into the shader, this was like super cool, but then I realized, oh yeah, shader programming is actually not that trivial. Um, so I ended up with very poor performance. Um, I did most of the development of this project on a five-year-old ThinkPad, which was fine, but then I ended up with like two or three uh, frames per second rendering, which is not real time at all. It feels very slow and awkward, um, which is why I'm presenting on a MacBook, because I get at least 15 <laughs> frames per second um, on the three-year-old MacBook, so yay. Um, so and, like, everything actually worked fine until I like, had the shader the way that I wanted. So it's probably my shader programming and all of the FFT data calculations that are done in a very bad way. So I need to look into this again. Um, last part, the interaction, um, which is like, yeah, the controller that I showed you. Um, might, I'm gonna hold it up again so you see it. This is a very cheap, um, like, yeah, online bought uh, USB gamepad. Um, and I thought, I wanna like, since this, was about like introducing people to like a playful side of technology. I thought this was like perfect because even if you don't like games or play games, you see a controller and you associate it with playfulness. Like if you, if you, like you might like be really enthusiastic about it or you look down upon it, but like the, the association is, is instantly here. And I thought it's perfect. Um, there's also this thing of like, I feel that sometimes people who work with computers professionally and they don't like them, they have like a keyboard and a mouse and it's like, work and then I can break things and like with the controller you like no I, like what what should I break like this is a thing that you can throw across the room which I've done several times and it still works it's awesome um, and I also think that the web gamepad API is super underrated um, because it has this like there's so many controllers that you can use and it's very very cool um, but I also see why it's not used that often um, first of all since the web offers like distribution of digital media like to anyone with a computer or like a phone. Um, but with, if, if you plan it to use it with a controller, you have to kind of like assume that the user has a controller, which is kind of like this, like a hurdle into like, um, yeah, experiencing the, te the technology. Um, and then the other thing is that there are a lot of different controllers out there, which the which makes it not that easy to develop for and like use it. And this has also like happened to me. I found this very cool library uh, called Contro, which has this like nice abstraction over um, the gamepad with like keyboard and mouse, but, uh, keyboard and mouse um, fallbacks. And I was like, ah, oh, that's so cool, but it didn't work with my controller that I had. Um, and then I looked a bit through the code and the author of the library developed it with an Xbox controller, which is kind of like a standard controller, but it's my controller is apparently not that standard to fit with the standard mapping or the remapping that the browser does of the gamepad. 
So I had to write some custom code, which does not have a keyboard fallback, so it can literally only interact with, the, with this specific keyboard, uh, with this specific controller. Um, but I would really like to look into this and then like make control because it's actually really good. Um, yeah, work with a more variety of, of controllers because I think this is like a very nice way to, to interact with things. Um, and this is it. Um, I'm gonna like end this off sort of like a note on I hinted at like very big big problems that we have, but I think also that there is um, even though I think a lot of technologists or like developers or like yeah technical people sometimes laugh off skepticism um, of people that we should not do this because there's still valid reasons for people to be skeptic about technology and um, because there is a lot of like bad things that are done with it, so it's it's kind of cool that people yeah, are not just like, that they're still thinking, and just like, hey, this can have bad um, side effects. Um, I'd like to advocate an ethical or sustainable use of technology in which we need both a curious and a cautious side. It's just that right now I feel that through mainstream media, which is a lot of what, yeah, normal people um, consume, um, there's more of like this, uh, or like advocates more for like a cautious and skeptic side, but I would also like, through work and like I think music is, is a very good way to do this um, advocate for like also the curious and joyful and playful side um, because we need both to like advance technology further. Um, here's a slide with further readings and materials but this is too much so I have you this slide and this is the last slide you can see the links and everything for there and thank you. Um, all right, so it's our, our question time. If you have any questions, you can go ahead and send it to our Slack channel, WAC 2018. Um, the first one that we have here is, um, what, what do you think the, the reason was for the WebGL performance problems? Um, very good question. Um, so I did the, so if you have like a, the audio analyzer node, oh, yeah, do the setup. Um, is that you can choose like the, um, like basically the size of, of the, the, the data that you want to get. So like um, something from 32 to 1040, 1024 um, things. Um, and I chose like, I was like, I'm going to go for like a middle thing, like uh, 512. And so maybe start the other way around. The way that the shader works is that I need to do, I basically call a main function that decides for every pixel on the canvas, what color should this pixel have? And the way I do the calculations right now is that I take the entire, like, like this array, or like in the end it's a vector in, in WebGL, um, of 512, and do basically the same calculation for every pixel, even though I could just basically pick uh, the corresponding um, value from this array for the specific pixel. But I did not figure out how to do this without breaking the shader. And the funny thing about shader, like shader debugging is that you can only see that it's not working. Um, it's just like blank. And it's like, yay, blank means it broke. Um, so I was like, okay, I need to like find a very smart way of like doing the calculations for this without using as little computation as possible. But it, it couldn't. Um, so I also thought about just like turning down the sample rate to like something like 32 or 64 um, to just have like less data to work with, but then I had like less data to work with. Um, so I thought it was like, okay, I'm just gonna take the hit for the poor performance. All right, we're gonna have to keep moving on. Okay, and, and, thank and you. Over.